Hello, I'm Laura Simonoff, Dean of Temple University's College of Public Health. And joining me are faculty experts, Graciela Yasha, Sarah Bass, Chris Johnson, and Heather Murphy. As most of you know, many places that had high levels of COVID-19 are starting to open up. And that includes the city of Philadelphia, where we are. However, that doesn't mean that the virus has gone away or we can simply go back to the way things were. Unfortunately, it's likely that we'll have to wait until the development of a vaccine to really, really go back to our lives as we knew it. So let's talk about what opening up will mean for us and how we can do more activities of public but still remain safe. So let's first talk about where we are in terms of the disease. Heather, can you discuss the COVID-19 statistics in terms of the nation and then here in Philadelphia? Sure, Laura. So right now we have a known 1.9 million cases across the U.S. and 110,000 deaths. So there's still a huge amount of coronavirus across the country. In Pennsylvania, we've exceeded 80,000 cases and 6,000 deaths, and we have 47 cases per 100,000. So our state has the sixth highest number of cases in the country. So that's important to keep in mind. Compared to other regions across the US, our cases are falling um, and some places are rising or staying the same. But places that are increasing in their number of cases include California, Florida, Texas, Michigan, Arizona, Tennessee, just to name a few. And so how do we actually know that our cases are falling? Um, at this stage, we have nearly 24,000 cases and 1,400 deaths in the city of Philadelphia but we have been holding relatively steady in Philadelphia at around 100 cases per day for the last week. But this number really doesn't matter if you're not looking at how much testing is being done. So if we only did 100 tests and there was 100, um, 100 negatives, that doesn't really, or 100 positives, it maybe doesn't mean as much as if we've done thousands of tests and 100 are positive. So when we look at it, we wanna look at kind of that denominator. So we've been keeping testing at around 1,600 to 2,000 tests per day, of which 100 are positive. So that's a 6% positivity rate. So for every person we test, um, only six out of 100 are testing positive. So that's actually a pretty good metric to look at. And the White House has come out with new recommendations stating that for a state to open up, they should have a positivity rate of less than 10%. Um, and to kind of put this into context of where we've come from, in April, we were over 35% of tests were coming back positive. So we've really cut that down. Um, but what's important is that we need to maintain this level of testing and ideally even increase it to keep flattening the curve. And also the other things that the White House is looking at for their new criteria, and we have also in Pennsylvania, is kind of this downward trajectory for over two weeks in reported cases. And we have been seeing that in Philadelphia. In addition, our hospitalizations seem to be going down. However, it's difficult to get a sense of the number of new hospitalizations per day because they're not reported. But as of yesterday in Philadelphia, there were 353 people that were in the hospital. Um, but back in April and May, we had around 900 people in the hospital. So we've cut that number uh, by a third, which is pretty right. good. That is really good. But, you know, it's interesting when you said about the places where cases are including, and I know uh, are increasing, and I know Washington State is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, maybe speak to what that <clears throat> what that means, because California was a state where the numbers were decreasing. Washington State was a state where the numbers were decreasing, but now they're going up. So, what do you make of that? I think they they've opened up in certain places, and then people haven't been taking precautions, and they haven't been mm -hmm. maintaining their social distancing. So if we just open up here in Philly, like we did last week, and people go back to life the way it used to be, then we're going to start to be on that increasing mm -hmm. trend. So I think it's important to keep doing what we're doing, and maybe we'll keep flattening this curve, but still remain safe um, in kind of a semi-open environment. Right. So Graciela, let, let's talk about that. You know, the weather is really lovely outside. Everybody wants to go out. I, I, I want to go out too. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about the risk for summer uh, with what we have experienced and, and also talk a little bit about what you think the fall will likely bring to us? Hey, sure. It's been a wonder, wonderful weather. Not raining, yeah. you know, sunny skies, 
But anyways, so experts at the World Health Organization and Centers for Disease Control and Prevention warned that COVID-19 virus will not go away in the foreseeable future. This is what you mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so it will stay with us and we will have to learn to live with it. Uh, meaning that perhaps it, we have to continue practicing social distancing, we have to wear face masks, washing hands frequently, and staying home uh, if we are sick. Those are the most effective weapons that we have against COVID-19. So if the coronavirus is not going away, will the risk of infection vary this seasonally? And uh, so what about the risk of transmission this summer, for instance? When school is out, we go on vacations, we open our windows, we spend time at the beach, and overall spend more time outdoors in the summer. So there is a growing consensus that being outdoors mitigates the risk of transmission. This is a little bit like the flu, uh, the flu virus that seems to disappear in the summer. But remember that the flu virus comes back in the, every winter, comes back every winter. So experts predict that this will likely happen with COVID, the COVID-19 virus. Uh, the risk of transmission may decrease in the summer, but the virus still exists. That's the whole message. The virus is still out there. And the fact that infections are not uh, now going up in some areas of the US and going down in other areas indicate that being outdoors in the heat and humidity will not eliminate transmission and additional infections. And what we, so in the summer, we naturally expect a, uh, cases going down but in the winter, on the other hand, when we return to work and school, we will all be indoors, often in close proximity, creating a fertile environment for transmission. Uh, and this is why we expect that the cases of COVID-19 will increase again in the winter months. So what I have to say, uh, you know, it, it seems we are all tired uh, and we, we just want this to be gone, but this is not going to go anytime soon. So let's learn how to be ready and better be prepared for it, particularly for in this incoming uh, winter. Thanks, Graciela. Um, so Chris, one of the things that's going on across the country is that people have been coming out to protest, huge protests. Social distancing seems pretty hard in these situations. And so can you give people some tips to say to stay safe during a protest? Sure. So first and foremost, as Graciela said, if you feel sick, feel sick, stay home. Um, if you feel well, then you should probably attend with a buddy group. And ideally, that would be the people that you live with. So that way you know who you're around and you're limiting the number of people who are going to be close to you that you don't know where they've been. You should also wear a mask and wear eye protection. And eye protection can be helpful for multiple different things. Um, but for coronavirus, it keeps particles from flying into your eyes, especially whenever, whenever other people are shouting or chanting. Um, I'd say don't wear any contacts because if something happens with your contacts, your first idea is to touch your eye. And that's, that's really bad for coronavirus. Um, so maybe wear glasses if you are a person who, who needs eye correction. And of course, pack plenty of hand sanitizer. Try to minimize that shouting and chanting. That way, if you're an asymptomatic person, you're not spreading mm -hmm. disease to other people because just talking can put viral particles out there. So shouting and chanting does that even more so. And then kind of out of, after the fact, you should make sure that you get tested because like you said, there's a lot of people in these, in these environments. So the likelihood that you've been around someone who is positive for coronavirus is pretty high. So, so how easy is it for somebody to get tested? So I'm asymptomatic, but I went to a protest. How would you get tested? So according to um, the testing protocol, <coughs> you should be able to get tested as long as you say that you have been in contact with a person who's been infected with coronavirus. And you shouldn't have to say that you've been at a protest. You just say that you've been in contact with someone with coronavirus and you should be able to get tested. Those are really good tips for people, I think. Um, so anything else that, that you're recommending for people? Like maybe, is there a type of mask that they should wear? Is there something special? Uh, as long as people are wearing something that covers their face fully and it, it fits their face well, that should be helpful in keeping any viral particles to themselves. 
But to your point, Laura, if people can't get tested, they should make sure to wear a mask of some sort or a face cover for the next three weeks just to avoid spreading disease in case they're an asymptomatic carrier as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so finally, Sarah, um, so now that things are getting better, I think a lot of people are getting pretty tired of doing things like washing their hands for 20 seconds. And I mean, I know I'm personally tired of singing happy birthday two times every time I wash my hands and I've tried to think of different songs. For example, the ABC song actually works quite well. Um, could you talk about outbreak fatigue and the impact of having something new come into our consciousness in the news like the protests that lowers the priority of the risk of COVID-19 in everybody's minds. Yeah, I mean, I think we are all fatigued. <laughs> um, you know, the last three months has been pretty hard on pretty much all of us. Um, and what's now happening in the U.S. and in the world, um, we're really in this what I would call crisis fatigue. Um, there's a, a meme that's going around social media for a bingo game for 2020, and the middle is just the word Godzilla. And I think that's how a lot of people are feeling about what we've been experiencing this year. Um, crisis fatigue, I think, can uh, manifest in a couple of ways. Uh, one is just on a societal level. So it can make um, us decide that we really can't do anything about what's happening, so we might as well just have fun. Um, and if you're having fun, if you're having fun, then so am I, right? So that, you know, then we cue these pictures of people on the beach or in the bar swimming pool. Um, on the second is just thinking about it from an individual level. So we all have uh, kind of a natural need for things to return to normal. Um, just like our physiology wants us to return to homeostasis after we're scared or we have heightened anxiety. Um, we as humans want to maintain normalcy in some way and our, our bodies are actually overwhelmed by the stress of this kind of onslaught of crises that we've had. Um, we can deal with that kind of in a short term, but over the course of weeks or months, this kind of heightened state, uh, which increases our risk perception too, has to have some pressure valve that releases kind of all the anxiety and gets us to a point of feeling more normal. So some of the ways we cope individually is to, you know, start thinking about why COVID-19 uh, it's not so bad, or it doesn't affect me, or that it's over. Um, and that's kind of the natural way that we lower that risk perception and get our sense of kind of optimism, bias, and normalcy back. Um, but unfortunately, as we know, uh, COVID-19 is not canceled, as they say in Twitterverse. Um, and we have to continue to challenge that sense of optimism without also getting people kind of in that panic mode again, you know, the buying out all of the toilet paper mode. Um, so it's just really too difficult to kind of communicate this the longer that things go on. Well, I think that's really good advice and, and I know it's hard for, for all of us. So um, we just have to keep keeping on at this, I think. So thanks for joining us today. Thanks to Chris and Heather and Sarah and Graciela Remember that we still need to stay six feet away from people we don't live with, wear a mask when we go outside or into a public building, and keep washing your hands. To view other videos and find links to reliable information, please visit our website, cph.temple.edu coronavirus. Thanks.